Section 19 of Yet Again by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ragged Regiment. Commonly called Longshanks, on account of his great height, he was the first king crowned in the abbey as it now appears, and was interred with great pomp on St. Simon's and St. June's Day, October 28th, 1307. In 1774 the tomb was opened, when the king's body was found almost entire. In the right hand was a richly embossed sceptre, and in the left... So much, I gather, as I pass one of the tombs on my way to the chapel of Abbot Islip. Anon, the verger will have stepped briskly forward, drawing a deep breath, with his flock well to heel, and will be telling the secrets of the next tomb on his tragic beat. To be a verger in Westminster Abbey, what life could be more unutterably tragic? We are all of us more or less enslaved to sameness, but not all of us are saying every day, hour after hour, exactly the same thing, in exactly the same place, in exactly the same tone of voice, to people who hear it for the first time and receive it with a gasp of respectful interest. In the name of humanity, I suggest to the dean and chapter that they should relieve these sad-faced men of their intolerable mission and purchase parrots. On every tomb, by every bust or statue, under every memorial window, let a parrot be chained by the ankle to a comfortable perch, therefrom to enlighten the rustic and the foreigner. There can be no objection on the ground of expense, for parrots live long. Vergers do not, I am sure. It is only the rustic and the foreigner who go to Westminster Abbey for general enlightenment. If you pause beside any one of the verger-led groups and analyze the murmur emitted whenever the verger has said his say, you will find the constituent parts of the sound to be such phrases as Lor! Ach so! Deary me! Tiens! And my! My preponderates, for antiquities appeal with greatest force to the one race that has none of them, and it is ever the Americans who hang the most tenaciously in the greatest numbers on the verger's tired lips. We of the elder races are capable of taking antiquities as a matter of course. Certainly such of us as reside in London take Westminster Abbey as a matter of course. A few of us will be buried in it, but meanwhile we don't go to it, even as we don't go to the tower, or the mint, or the monument. Only for some special purpose do we go, as to hear a sensational bishop preaching, or to see a monarch anointed. And on these rare occasions we cast but a casual glance at the abbey, that close-packed chaos of beautiful things, and worthless vulgar things. That the abbey should be thus chaotic does not seem strange to us, for lack of orderliness and discrimination is an essential characteristic of the English genius. But to the Frenchman, with his passion for symmetry and harmony, how very strange it must all seem! How very whole-hearted a generalizing tiens must he utter when he leaves the edifice my own special purpose in coming is to see certain old waxen effigies that are here in its original form this essay had the good fortune to accompany two very romantic drawings by william nicholson one of queen elizabeth's effigy the other of charles the second's a key grates in the lock of a little door in the wall of what i am told is the north ambulatory 
and up a winding wooden staircase i am ushered into a tiny paven chamber the light is dim through the deeply embraced and narrow window and the space is so obstructed that i must pick my way warily all around are deep wooden cupboards faced with glass and i become dimly aware that through each glass some one is watching me like sentinels in sentry boxes they fix me with their eyes seeming as though they would challenge me how shall i account to them for my presence i slip my notebook into my pocket and try in the dim light to look as unlike a spy as possible but i cannot try as i will acquit myself of impertinence who am i that i should review this ragged regiment who am i that i should come peering in upon this secret conclave of the august dead immobile and dark very gaunt and withered these personages peer out at me with a malign dignity through the ages which separate me from them through the twilight in which i am so near to them their eyes come sir their eyes are made of glass it is quite absurd to take waxworks seriously waxworks are not a serious form of art the aim of art is so to imitate life as to produce in the spectator an illusion of life wax works at best can produce no such illusion don't pretend to be eluded for its power to elude an art depends on its limitations art never can be life but it may seem to be so if it do but keep far enough away from life a statue may seem to live a painting may seem to live that is because each is so far away from life that you do not apply the test of life to it a statue is of bronze or marble than either of which nothing could be less flesh-like a painting is a thing in two dimensions whereas man is in three if sculptor or painter tried to dodge these conventions his labour would be undone if a painter swelled his canvas out and in according to the convexities and concavities of his model or if a sculptor overlaid his material with authentic flesh tints then you would demand that the painted or sculpted figure should blink or stroke its chin or kick its foot in the air that it could do none of these things would rob it of all power to elude you an art that challenges life at close quarters is defeated through the simple fact that it is not life waxworks being so near to life having the exact proportions of men and women having the exact texture of skin and hair and habiliments must either be animate or continue to be grotesque and pitiful failures lifelike they rather do they give you the illusion of death they are akin to photographs seen through stereoscopic lenses those photographs of persons who seem horribly to be corpses or at least catalepts and you see i have failed to cheer myself up having taken up a strong academic line and set bravely out to prove to myself the absurdity of waxworks i find myself at the point where i started irrefutably arguing to myself that i have good reason to be frightened here in the chapel of abbot islip in the midst of these the abbot's glowering and ghastly tenants catalepsy death that is the atmosphere i am breathing if i were writing in the past tense i might pause here to consider whether this emotion was a genuine one or a mere figment for literary effect as i am writing in the present tense such a pause would be inartistic and shall not be made i must seem not to be writing but to be actually on the spot suffering 
But then, you may well ask, why should I stay here to suffer? Why not beat a hasty retreat? The answer is that my essay would then seem skimpy, and that you, moreover, would know hardly anything about the waxworks. So I must ask you to imagine me fighting down my fears and consoling myself with the reflection that here, after all, a sense of awe and oppression is just what one ought to feel, just what one comes for. At Madame Tussaud's exhibition, by which I was similarly afflicted some years ago, I had no such consolation. There, my sense of fitness was outraged. The place was meant to be cheerful. It was brilliantly lit. A band was playing popular tunes. Downstairs there was even a restaurant. Let fancy fondly dwell for a moment on the thought of a dinner at Madame Tussaud's, a few carefully selected guests, and a menu well thought out, conversation becoming general, corks popping, quips flying, a sense of bien-être. Thank you for a most delightful evening. Madame's figures were meant to be agreeable and lively presentments. Her visitors were meant to have a thoroughly good time. But the Islip Chapel has no cheerful intent. It is, indeed, a place set aside, with all reverence, to preserve certain relics of a grim, yet not unlovely, old custom. These fearful images are no stock-in-trade of a showman. We are not invited to walk up to them. They were fashioned with a solemn and wistful purpose. The reason of them lies in a sentiment which is as old as the world, lies in man's vain revolt from the prospect of death. If the soul must perish from the body, may not at least the body itself be preserved, somewhat in the semblance of life, and, for at least a while, on the face of the earth? By subtle art, with far-fetched spices, let the body survive its day, and be, even though hidden beneath the earth, for ever. Nay, more! Since death cause it straightway to dwindle somewhat from the true semblance of life, let cunning artificers fashion it anew, fashion it as it was. Thus, in the earliest days of England, the kings, as they died, were embalmed, and their bodies were borne aloft upon their biers to a sepulchre long delayed after death. In later days, an image of every king that died was forthwith carved in wood, and painted according to his remembered aspect, and decked in his own robes. And when they had sealed his tomb, the mourners, humouring to the best of their power his hatred of extinction, laid this image upon the tomb's slab, and left it so. In yet later years, the pretense became more realistic. The hands and the face were modelled in wax, and the figure stood upright in some commanding posture, on a valenced platform above the tomb. Nor were only the kings thus honoured. Every one who was interred in the abbey, whether in virtue of lineage or of achievements, was honoured thus. It was the fashion for every great lady to write in her will minute instructions as to the posture in which her image was to be modelled, and which of her gowns it was to be clad in, and with what of her jewellery it was to glitter. Men, too, used to indulge in such precautions. Of all the images thus erected in the abbey, there remain but a few. The images had to take their chance in days that were without benefit of police. Thieves, we may suppose, stripped the finery from many of them. Rebels, we know, broke in, less ignobly, and tore many of them limb from limb, as a protest against the governing classes. So only a poor remnant, a ragged regiment, 
has been rallied at length into the sanctuary of Islip's chapel. Perhaps, if they were not so few, these images would not be so fascinating. Yes, I am fascinated by them now. Terror has been toned to wonder. I am filled with a kind of wondering pity. My academic theory about waxworks has broken down utterly. These figures, kings, princes, duchesses, queens, are all real to me now, and all are infinitely pathetic in the dignity of their fallen and forgotten greatness. With what inalienable majesty they wear their rusty velvets and faded silks, flaunting sere ruffles of point lace, which, at a touch now, would be shivered like cobwebs. My heart goes out to them through the glass that divides us. I wish I could stay with them, bear them company, always. I think they like me. I am afraid they will miss me. Perhaps it would have been better for us never to have met. Even Queen Elizabeth, beholding whom, as she stands here, gaunt and imperious and appalling, I echo the words spoken by Philip's envoy, this woman is possessed of a hundred thousand devils. Even she herself, though she gazes askance into the air, seems to be conscious of my presence, and to be willing me to stay. It is a relief to meet the friendly bourgeois eye of good Queen Anne. It has restored my common sense. These figures really are most curious, most interesting. And anon I am asking intelligent questions about the contents of a big press, which, by special favour, has been unlocked for me. Perhaps the most romantic thing in the Islip Chapel is this press. Herein, huddled one against another in dark recesses, lie the battered and disjected remains of the earlier effigies, the primitive wooden ones. Edward I and Eleanor are known to be among them, and Henry the Seventh and Elizabeth of York, and others not less illustrious. Which is which? By size and shape you can distinguish the men from the women, but beyond that is mere guesswork, be you never so expert. Time has broken and shuffled these erst so significant effigies, till they have become as unmeaning for us as the bones in one of the old plague pits. I feel that I ought to be more deeply moved than I am by this sad state of things, but I seem to have exhausted my capacity for sentiment, and I cannot rise to the level of my opportunity. Would that I were Thackeray! Dear gentlemen, how promptly and copiously he would have wept and moralized here, in his grandest manner, with that perfect technical mastery which makes, even now, his tritest and shallowest sermons sound remarkable, his hollowest sentiment ring true. What a pity he never came to beat the muffled drum, on which he was so supreme a performer, around the Islip Chapel. As I make my way down the stairs, I am trying to imagine what would have been the cadence of the final sentence in this essay by Thackeray. And, as I pass along the northern ambulatory, lo, there is the same verger with a new party, and I catch the words was interred with great pomp on St. Simon's and St. June's Day, October 28, 1307. In 1774 the tomb was opened when... End of section 19section 20 of yet again by max beerbohm this librivox recording is in the public domain the humor of the public
they often tell me that so-and-so has no sense of humour lack of this sense is everywhere held to be a horrid disgrace nullifying any number of delightful qualities perhaps the most effective means of disparaging an enemy is to lay stress on his integrity his erudition his amiability his courage the fineness of his head the grace of his figure his strength of purpose which has overleaped all obstacles his goodness to his parents the kind word that he has for every one his musical voice his freedom from aught that in human nature is base and then to say what a pity it is that he has no sense of humour the more highly you extol any one the more eagerly will your audience accept anything you may have to say against him perfection is unloved in this imperfect world but for imperfection comes instant sympathy any excuse is good enough for exalting the bad or stupid brother of us but any stick is a valued weapon against him who has the effrontery to have been by heaven better graced than we and what could match for deadliness the imputation of being without a sense of humour to convict a man of that lack is to strike him with one blow to a level with the beasts of the field to kick him once and for all outside the human pale what is it that mainly distinguishes us from the brute creation that we walk erect some brutes are bipeds that we do not slay one another we do that we build houses so do they that we remember and reason so again do they that we converse they are chatterboxes whose lingo we are not sharp enough to master on no possible point of superiority can we preen ourselves save this that we can laugh that they with one notable exception cannot they so at least we assert have no sense of humour we have a way with any one of us who hasn't belief in the general humorousness of the human race is the more deep-rooted for that every man is certain that he himself is not without a sense of humour a man will admit cheerfully that he does not know one tune from another or that he cannot discriminate the vintages of wines the blind beggar does not seek to benumb sympathy by telling his patrons how well they are looking the deaf and dumb do not scruple to converse in signals have you no sense of beauty i said to a friend who in the academia of florence suggested that we had stood long enough in front of primavera no was his simple straightforward quite unanswerable answer but i have never heard a man assert that he had no sense of humour and i take it that no such assertion ever was made moreover were it made it would be a lie every man laughs frequently or infrequently the corners of his mouth are drawn up into his cheeks and through his parted lips comes his own particular variety soft or loud of the noise which is called laughter frequently or infrequently every man is amused by something every man has a sense of humour but not every man the same sense a may be incapable of smiling at what has convulsed b and b may stare blankly when he hears what has rolled a off his chair jokes are so diverse that no one man can see them all the very fact that he can see one kind is proof positive that certain other kinds will be invisible to him and so egotistic in his judgment is the average man that he is apt to suspect of being humourless any one whose sense of humour squares not with his own but the suspicion is always false incomparably useful though it is in the form of an accusation having no love for the public i have often accused that body of having no sense of humour conscience pricks me to atonement let me withdraw my oft-made imputation and show its hollowness by examining with you reader 
who are, of course, no more a member of the public than I am, what are the main features of that sense of humour which the public does undoubtedly possess? The word public must, like all collective words, be used with caution. When we speak of our hair, we should remember not only that the hairs on our head are all numbered, but also that there is a catalogue raisonné in which every one of those hairs is shown to be in some respect unique. Similarly, let us not forget that the public denotes a collection of not identical units, but of units separable and, under close scrutiny, distinguishable one from another i have said that not every man has the same sense of humour i might have said truly that no two men have the same sense of humour for that no two men have the same brain and heart and experience by which things the sense of humour is formed and directed one joke may go round the world tickling myriads but not two persons will be tickled in precisely the same way to precisely the same degree if the vibrations of inward or outward laughter could be as some day perhaps they will be scientifically registered differences between them all would be made apparent to us oh is your cry whenever you hear something that especially amuses you i must tell that to whomever you credit with a sense of humour most akin to your own and the chances are that you will be disappointed by his reception of the joke either he will laugh less loudly than you hoped or he will say something which reveals to you that it amuses him and you not in quite the same way or perhaps he will laugh so long and loudly that you are irritated by the suspicion that you have not yourself gauged the full beauty of it in one of his books i do not remember which though they too i suppose are all numbered mr andrew lang tells a story that has always delighted and always will delight me he was in a railway carriage and his travelling companions were two strangers two silent ladies middle-aged the train stopped at nuneaton the two ladies exchanged a glance one of them sighed and said poor eliza she had reason to remember nuneaton that is all but how much how deliciously and memorably much how infinite a span of conjecture is in those dots which i have just made and yet would you believe me some of my most intimate friends the people most like to myself see little or nothing of the loveliness of that pearl of price perhaps you would believe me that is the worst of it one never knows the most sensitive intelligence cannot predict how will be appreciated its any treasure by its how near soever kin this sentence which i admit to be somewhat mannered has the merit of bringing me straight to the point at which i have been aiming that though the public is composed of distinct units it may roughly be regarded as a single entity precisely because you and i have sensitive intelligences we cannot postulate certainly anything about each other the higher an animal be in grade the more numerous and recondite are the points in which its organism differs from that of its peers the lower the grade the more numerous and obvious the points of likeness by the public i mean that vast number of human animals who are in the lowest grade of intelligence of course this classification is made without reference to social classes the public is recruited from the upper the middle and the lower class that the recruits come mostly from the lower class is because the lower class is still the least well educated that they come in as high proportion from the middle class as from the less well-educated upper class is because the young barbarians reared in a more gracious environment often acquire a grace of mind which serves them as well as would mental keenness whereas in the highest grade to which you and i belong 
The fact that a thing affects you in one way is no guarantee that it will not affect me in another. A thing which affects one man of the lowest grade in a particular way is likely to affect all the rest very similarly. The public sense of humour may be regarded roughly as one collective sense. It would be impossible for any one of us to define what are the things that amuse him. For him the wind of humour bloweth where it listeth. He finds his jokes in the unlikeliest places. Indeed, it is only there that he finds them at all. A thing that is labelled comic chills his sense of humour instantly, perceptibly lengthens his face. A joke that has not a serious background or some serious connection means nothing to him. Nothing to him, the crude jape of the professional jester. Nothing to him, the jangle of the bells in the wagged cap the thud of the swung bladder nothing the joke that hits him violently in the eye or pricks him with a sharp point the jokes that he loves are those quiet jokes which have no apparent point the jokes which never can surrender their secret and so never can pall his humour is an indistinguishable part of his soul and the things that stir it are indistinguishable from the world around him but to the primitive and untutored public, humour is a harshly definite affair. The public can achieve no delicate process of discernment in humour. Unless a joke hits in the eye, drawing forth a shower of illuminative sparks, all is darkness. Unless a joke be labelled, Comic, come, why don't you laugh? The public is quite silent violence and obviousness are thus the essential factors the surest way of making a thing obvious is to provide it in some special place at some special time it is thus that humour is provided for the public and thus that it is easy for the student to lay his hand on materials for an analysis of the public sense of humour the obviously right plan for the student is to visit the music halls from time to time and to buy the comic papers neither these halls nor these papers will amuse him directly through their art but he will instruct himself quicklier and soundlier from then than from any other source for they are the authentic sources of the public's laughter let him hasten to patronize them he will find that i have been there before him the music halls i have known for many years i mean of course the real old-fashioned music halls not those depressing palaces where you see by grace of a biograph things that you have seen much better and without a headache in the street and pitiable animals being forced to do things which nature has forbidden them to do things which we can do so very much better than they without any trouble heaven defend me from those meaningless palaces but the little old music halls have always attracted me by their unpretentious raciness their quaint monotony the reality of the enjoyment of all those stolidly rapt faces in the audience without that monotony there would not be the same air of general enjoyment the same constant guffaws that monotony is the secret of the success of the music halls it is not enough for the public to know that everything is meant to be funny that laughter is craved for every point in every turn a new kind of humour however obvious and violent might take the public unawares and be received in silence the public prefers always the old well-tested and well-seasoned jokes be cracked for it or rather not the same old jokes but jokes on the same old subjects the quality of the joke is of slight import in comparison with its subject it is the matter rather than the treatment that counts in the art of the music hall some subjects have come to be recognized as funny two or three of them crop up in every song and before the close of the evening all of them will have cropped up many times i speak with authority as an earnest student of the music halls 
Of comic papers I know less. They have never allured me. They are not set to music, an art for whose cheaper and more primitive forms I have a very real sensibility. And I am not, as I peruse one of them, privy to the public's delight. My copy cannot be shared with me by hundreds of people whose mirth is wonderful to see and hear, and the bare contents are not such as to enchant me. However, for the purpose of this essay, I did go to a bookstall and buy as many of these papers as I could see. A terrific number. A terrific burden to stagger away with. I have gone steadily through them, one by one. My main impression is of wonder and horror at the amount of hebdomadal labor implicit in them. Who writes for them? Who does the drawings for them? Those thousands of little drawings, week by week, so neatly executed. To think that daily and nightly, in so many an English home, in a room sacred to the artist, sits a young man inventing and executing designs for chippy snips to think how many a proud mother must be boasting to her friends yes edward is doing wonderfully well more than fulfilling the hopes we always had of him did i tell you that the editor of natty tips has written asking him to contribute to his paper i believe i have the letter on me yes here it is etc etc the awful thing is that many of the drawings in these comic papers are done with real skill. Nothing is sadder than to see the hand of an artist wasted by alliance to a vacant mind, a common spirit. I look through these drawings, conceived all so tritely and stupidly, so hopelessly and helplessly, yet executed, many of them, so very well indeed and I sigh over the haphazard way in which mankind is made. However, my concern is not with the tragedy of these draftsmen, but with the specific forms taken by their humour. Some of them deal in a broad spirit with the world comedy, limiting themselves to no set of funny subjects, finding inspiration in the habits and manners of men and women at large he won her is the title appended to a picture of a young lady and gentleman seated in a drawing-room and the libretto runs thus mabel last night i dreamt of a most beautiful woman harold rather a coincidence i dreamt of you too last night i have selected this as a typical example of the larger style this style however occupies but a small space in the bulk of the papers that lie before me as in the music halls so in these papers the entertainment consists almost entirely of variations on certain ever-recurring themes i have been at pains to draw up a list of these themes i think it is exhaustive if any fellow student detect an omission let him communicate with me Meanwhile, here is my list. Mothers-in-law. Hen-pecked husbands. Twins. Old maids. Jews. Frenchmen, Germans, Italians, niggers. Not Russians or other foreigners of any denomination. Fatness. Thinness. Long hair, worn by a man. Baldness seasickness stuttering bad cheese shooting the moon slang expression for leaving a lodging-house without paying the bill you might argue that one week's budget of comic papers is no real criterion that the recurrence of these themes may be fortuitous my answer to that objection is that list coincides exactly with a list which before studying these papers i had made of the themes commonest during the past few years in the music halls this twin list which results from separate study of the two chief forms of public entertainment 
may be taken as a sure guide to the goal of our inquiry. Let us try to find some unifying principle or principles among the variegated items. Take the first item, mothers-in-law. Why should the public roar, as war it does, at the mere mention of that relationship? There is nothing intrinsically absurd in the notion of a woman with a married daughter. It is probable that she will sympathize with her daughter in any quarrel that may arise between husband and wife. It is probable also that she will, as a mother, demand for her daughter more unselfish devotion than the daughter herself expects. But this does not make her ridiculous. The public laughs not at her, surely. It always respects a tyrant. It laughs at the implied concept of the oppressed son-in-law, who has to wage unequal warfare against two women. It is amused by the notion of his embarrassment. It is amused by suffering. This explanation covers, of course, the second item on my list, hen-pecked husbands. It covers also the third and fourth items. The public is amused by the notion of a needy man put to double expense, and of a woman who has had no chance of fulfilling her destiny. The laughter at Jews, too, may be a survival of the old Jew-baiting spirit, though one would have thought that even the British public must have begun to realize, and to reflect gloomily, that the whirligig of time has so far revolved as to enable the Jews to bait the Gentiles. Or this laughter may be explained by the fact which alone can explain why the public laughs at Frenchmen, Germans, Italians, niggers. Jews, after all, are foreigners, strangers. The British public has never got used to them, to their faces and tricks of speech. The only apparent reason why it laughs at the notion of Frenchmen, etc., is that they are unlike itself. At the mention of Russians and other foreigners it does not laugh, because it has no idea what they are like. It has seen too few samples of them. So far, then, we have found two elements in the public's humour. Delight in suffering, contempt for the unfamiliar. The former motive is the more potent. It accounts for the popularity of all those other items. Extreme fatness, extreme thinness, baldness, seasickness, stuttering, and, as entailing distress for the landlady, shooting the moon. The motive of contempt for the unfamiliar accounts for the long hair worn by a man. Remains one item unexplained. How can mirth possibly be evoked by the notion of bad cheese? Having racked my brains for the solution, I can but conjecture that it must be the mere ugliness of the thing. Why anyone should be amused by mere ugliness, I cannot conceive. Delight in cruelty, contempt for the unfamiliar, I can understand, though I cannot admire them. They are invariable elements in children's sense of humour, and it is natural that the public, as being unsophisticated, should laugh as children laugh. But any nurse will tell you that children are frightened by ugliness. Why, then, is the public amused by it? I know not. The laughter at bad cheese I abandon as a mystery. I pitch it among such other insoluble problems as why does the public laugh when an actor and actress in a quite serious play kiss each other? Why does it laugh when a meal is eaten on the stage? Why does it laugh when an actor has to say, damn? If they cannot be solved soon, such problems will never be solved. For Mr. Forster's act will soon have had time to make apparent its effects and the public will proudly display a sense of humour as sophisticated as our own. End of section 20
Section 21 of Yet Again by Max Beerbohm. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Dulcedo Judiciorum. When a sensational case is being tried, the court is well filled by lay persons in need of a thrill. Their presence seems to be rather resented as a note of frivolity, a discord in the solemnity of the function, even a possible distraction for the judge and jury. I am not a lawyer, nor a professionally solemn person, and I cannot work myself up into a state of indignation against the interlopers. I am, indeed, one of them myself, and I am worse than one of them, I do not merely go to this or that court on this or that special occasion. I frequent the courts whenever I have nothing better to do. And it is rarely that, as one who cares to study his fellow creatures, I have anything better to do. I greatly wonder that the courts are frequented by so few other people who have no special business there. I can understand the glamour of the theatre. You find yourself in a queerly shaped place, cut off from the world, with plenty of gilding and red velvet or blue satin. An orchestra plays tunes calculated to promote suppressed excitement. Presently up goes a curtain, revealing to you a mimic world, with ladies and gentlemen painted and padded to appear different from what they are. It is precisely the people most susceptible to the glamour of the theatre who are the greatest hindrances to serious dramatic art. They will stand anything, no matter how silly, in a theatre. Fortunately, there seems to be a decline in the number of people who are acutely susceptible to the theatre's glamour. I rather think the reason for this is that the theatre has been over-exploited by the press. Quite old people will describe to you their early play-goings with a sense of wonder, an enthusiasm, which, leaving a wide margin for the charm that past things must always have, will not be possible to us when we babble to our grandchildren. Quite young people people ranging between the ages of four and five, who have seen but one or two pantomimes, still seem to have the glamour of the theatre full on them. But adolescents and people in the prime of life do merely, for the most part, grumble about the quality of the plays. Yet the plays of our time are somewhat better than the plays that were written for our elders. Certainly the glamour of the theatre has waned, and so much the better for the drama's future. It is a matter of concern, that future, to me, who have for so long a time been a drama critic. A man soon comes to care, quite unselfishly, about the welfare of the thing in which he has specialised. Of course I care selfishly, too, for, though it is just as easy for a critic to write interestingly about bad things as about good things, he would rather, for choice, be in contact with good things. It is always nice to combine business and pleasure, but one regrets, even then, the business. If I were a forensic critic, my delight in attending the courts would still be great, but less than it is in my irresponsibility. In the courts I find satisfied in me just those senses which, in the theatre, nearly always, are starved. Nay, I find them satisfied more fully than they ever could be, at best, in any theatre. I do not merely fall back on the courts in disgust of the theatre as it is, I love the courts better than the theatre as it ideally might be. And, I say again, I marvel that you leave me so much elbow-room there. No artificial light is needed, no scraping of fiddles to excite or charm me as I pass from the echoing corridor through the swing-doors into the well of this or that court. 
it matters not much to me what case i shall hear so it be of the human kind with a jury and with witnesses i care little for chancery cases there is a certain intellectual pleasure in hearing a mass of facts subtly wrangled over the mind derives therefrom something of the satisfaction that the eye has in watching acrobats in a music-hall one wonders at the ingenuity the agility the perfect training like acrobats these chancery lawyers are a relief from the average troop of actors and actresses by reason of their exquisite alertness their thorough mastery seemingly exquisite and thorough at any rate to the dazzled layman and they have a further advantage in their material the facts they deal with are usually dull but seldom so dull as facts become through the fancies of the average playwright it is seldom that an evening in a theatre can be so pleasantly and profitably spent as a day in a chancery court but it is ever into one or another of the courts of king's bench that i betake myself for choice criminal trials of which i have seen a few i now eschew absolutely i cannot stomach them i know that it is necessary for the good of the community that such persons as infringe that community's laws should be punished but even were the mode of punishment less barbarous than it is i should still prefer not to be brought in sight of a prisoner in the dock perhaps because i have not a strongly developed imagination i have little or no public spirit i cannot see the commonweal on the other hand i have plenty of personal feeling and i have enough knowledge of men and women to know that very often the best people are guilty of the worst things is the prisoner in the dock guilty or not guilty of the offence with which he is charged that is the question in the mind of the court what sort of man is he that is the question in my own mind and the answer to the other question has no bearing whatsoever on the answer to this one the english law assumes the prisoner innocent until he shall have been proved guilty and seeing him there a prisoner a man who happens to have been caught while others myself included are pleasantly at large after doing unbeknown innumerable deeds worse in the eyes of heaven than the deed with which this man is charged deeds that do not prevent us from regarding our characters as quite fine really i cannot but follow in my heart the example of the english law and assume pending proof which cannot be forthcoming that the prisoner in the dock has a character at any rate as fine as my own the war that this assumption wages in my breast against the fact that the man will perhaps be sentenced is too violent a war not to discommode me let justice be done or rather let our rough-and-ready well-meant endeavours towards justice go on being made but i won't be there to see thank you very much it is the natural wish of every writer to be liked by his readers but how exasperating how detestable the writer who obviously touts for our affection arranging himself for us in a mellow light and inviting us with gentle persistence to note how lovable he is many essayists have made themselves quite impossible through their determination to remind us of charles lamb saint charles as they invariably call him and the foregoing paragraph would be lamb-like in expression looks to me horribly like a blatant bid for your love i hasten to add therefore that no absolutely kind-hearted person could bear as i rejoice to go and hear cases even in the civil courts if it be true that the instinct of cruelty is at the root of our pleasure in the theatrical drama how much more is there of savagery in our going to look on at the throes of actual litigation 
real men and women struggling not in make-believe but in dreadful earnest i mention this aspect merely as a corrective to what i had written i do not pretend that i am ever conscious as i enter a court that i am come to gratify an evil instinct i am but conscious of being glad to be there on tiptoe of anticipation whether it be to hear tried some particular case of whose matter i know already something or to hear at hazard whatever case happened to be down for hearing i never tire of the aspect of a court the ways of a court familiarity does but spice them i love the cold comfort of the pale oak panelling the scurrying in and out of lawyers clerks the eagerness and ominousness of it all the rustle of silk as a k c edges his way to his seat and twists his head round for a quick whispered parley with his junior while his client at the solicitor's table twists his head round to watch feverishly the quick mechanical nods of the great man's wig the wig that covers the skull that contains the brain that so awfully much depends on i love the mystery of those dark green curtains behind the exalted bench one of them will anon be plucked aside with a stentorian silence thereat up we jump all of us as though worked by one spring and in shuffles swiftly my lord in a robe well fashioned for sitting in but not for walking in anywhere except to a bathroom he bows and we bow subsides and we subside and up jumps some grizzled junior my lord may i mention to your lordship the case of brown v robinson and another it is music to me ever the cadence of that formula i watch the judge as he listens to the application peering over his glasses with the lacklustre eyes that judges have eyes that stare dimly out through the mask of wax or parchment that judges wear my lord might be the mummy of some high tyrant revitalized after centuries of death and resuming now his sway over men impassive he sits aloof and aloft ramparted by his desk ensconced between curtains to keep out the draught for might not a puff of wind scatter the animated dust that he consists of no creature of flesh and blood could impress us quite as he does with a sense of puissance quite so dispassionate so supernal he crouches over us in such a manner that we are all of us levelled one with another shorn of aught that elsewhere differentiates us the silk gownsmen as soon as he appears fade to the semblance of juniors of lawyers clerks of jurymen of one self always indeed in any public place devoted to some special purpose one finds it hard to differentiate the visitors hard to credit them with any private existence cast your eye around the tables of a cafe how subtly similar all the people seem how like a swarm of gregarious insects in their unity of purpose and of aspect above all how homeless cast your eye around the tables of a casino's gambling room what a uniform and abject herd huddled together with one despondent impulse here and there may be a person whom we know to be vastly rich yet we cannot conceive his calm as not the calm of inward desperation cannot conceive that he has anything to bless himself with except the roll of banknotes that he has just produced from his breast pocket one and all the players are levelled by the invisible pretence of the goddess they are courting 
well the visible presence of the judge in a court of law oppresses us with a yet keener sense of lowliness and obliteration he crouches over us visible symbol of the majesty of the law and we wilt to the nothingness beneath him and when i say him i include the whole judicial bench judges vary no doubt some are young others old by the calendar but the old ones have an air of physical incorruptibility are well preserved as by swathes and spices and the young ones are just as mummified as they some of them are pleased to crack jokes jokes of the sarcophagus that twist our lips to obsequious laughter but send a chill through our souls there are strong judges and weak ones so barristers will tell you perhaps who knows minos was a strong judge and achus and rhadamanthus were weak ones but all three seem equally terrible to us and so seem in virtue of their position and of the manner and aspect it invests them with all the judges of our own high courts i hearken in awe to the toneless murmur in which my lord comments on the application in the case of brown v robinson and another he says something about the court of crown cases reserved ah what place on this earth bears a name so mystically majestic even in the commonest forensic phrases there is often this solemnity of cadence always a quaintness that stirs the imagination the grizzled junior dares interject something with submission and is finally advised to see my learned brother in chambers as your lordship pleases we pass to the business of the day i settle myself to enjoy the keenest form of aesthetic pleasure that is known to me aesthetic yes in the law courts one finds an art form as surely as in the theatre what is drama its theme is the actions of certain opposed persons historical or imagined within a certain period of time and these actions these characters must be shown to us in a succinct manner must be so arranged that we know just what in them is essential to our understanding of them very similar is the art form practised in the law courts the theme of a lawsuit is the actions of certain actual opposed persons within a certain period of time and these actions these characters must be set forth succinctly in such wise that we shall know just as much as is essential to our understanding of them in drama the presentiment is in a sense more vivid it is not not usually at least retrospective we see the actions being committed hear the words as they are uttered but how often do we have an illusion of their reality seldom it is seldom that a masterpiece in drama is performed perfectly by an ideal cast in a law court on the other hand it is always in perfect form that the matter is presented to us first the outline of the story in the speech for the plaintiff then this outline filled in by the examination of the plaintiff himself then the other side of the story adumbrated by his cross-examination think of the various further stages of a lawsuit culminating in the judge's summing up and you will agree with me that the whole thing is a perfect art form drama at its best is clumsy arbitrary unsatisfying by comparison but what makes a lawsuit the most fascinating to me of all art forms is that not merely its material but the chief means of its expression is life itself here cited before us are the actual figures in the actual story that has been told to us 
here they are not as images to be evoked through the medium of printed page or of painted canvas or of disinterested ladies and gentlemen behind footlights actual authentic they stand before us one by one in the harsh light of day to be made to reveal all that we need to know of them the most interesting witnesses i admit are they who are determined not to accommodate us not to reveal themselves as they are but to make us suppose them something quite different all witnesses are more or less interesting as i have suggested there is no such thing as a dull lawsuit nothing that has happened is negligible and even so every human being repays attention especially so when he stands forth on his oath the strangeness of his position and his consciousness of it suffice in themselves to make him interesting but it is disingenuousness that makes him delightful and the greatest of all delights that a law court can give us is a disingenuous witness who is quick-minded resourceful thoroughly master of himself and his story pitted against a counsel as well endowed as himself the most vivid and precious of my memories is of a case in which a gentleman now dead was sued for breach of promise and was cross-examined throughout a whole hot day in midsummer by the late mr candy the lady had averred that she had known him for many years she called various witnesses who testified to having seen him repeatedly in her company she produced stacks of letters in a handwriting which no expert could distinguish from his the defence was that these letters were written by the defendant's secretary a man who was able to imitate exactly his employer's handwriting and who was moreover physically a replica of his employer he was dead now and the defendant though he was a very well-known man with many friends was unable to adduce any one who had seen that secretary dead or alive not a soul in the court believed the story as it was a complicated story extending over many years to demolish it seemed child's play mr candy was no child his performance was masterly but it was not so masterly as the defendant's and the suit was dismissed in the light of common sense the defendant hadn't a leg to stand on technically his case was proved i doubt whether i shall ever have a day of such acute mental enjoyment as was the day of that cross-examination i suppose that the most famous cross-examination in our day was sir charles russell's of pigott it outstands by reason of the magnitude of the issue and the flight and suicide of the witness had pigott been of the stuff to stand up to russell and make a fight of it i should regret far more keenly than i do that i was not in court as it is my regret is keen enough i was reading again only the other day the verbatim report of pigott's evidence in one of the series of little paper volumes published by the times and i was revelling again in the large perfection with which russell accomplished his too easy task especially was i amazed to find how vividly russell as i remember him lived again and could be seen and heard through the medium of that little paper volume it was not merely as though i had been in court and were now recalling the inflections of that deep intimidating voice the steadfast gaze of those dark intimidating eyes and were remembering just at what points the snuff-box was produced and just how long the pause was before the pinch was taken and the bandana came into play it was almost as though these effects were proceeding before my very eyes 
these sublime effects of the finest actor I have ever seen. Expressed through a perfect technique, his personality was overwhelming. Come, Mr. Piggott, he is reported as saying at a crucial moment, try to do yourself justice. Remember, you are face to face with my lords. How well do I hear, in that awful hortation, Russell's pause after the word remember, and the lowered voice in which the subsequent words were uttered slowly, and the richness of solemnity that was given to the last word of all, ere the thin lips snapped together, those lips that were so small yet so significant a feature of that large, white, luminous, and inauspicious face. It is an hortation which, by whomsoever delivered, would tend to dispirit the bravest and most honest of witnesses. The presence of a judge is always, as I have said, oppressive. The presence of three is trebly so. Yet not a score of them, serried along the bench, could have outdone in oppressiveness Sir Charles Russell. He alone, among the counsel I have seen, was an exception to the rule that by a judge every one in court is leveled. On the bench, in his last years, he was not notably more predominant than he ever had been and the reason of his predominance at the bar was not so much in the fact that he had no rivals in swiftness, in subtlety, in grasp, as in the passionate strength of his nature, the intensity that in him was at the root of the grand manner. In the courts, as in Parliament and in the theatre, the grand manner is a thing of the past. Mr. Lloyd George is not, in style and method, more remote from Gladstone, nor Mr. George Alexander from Macready, than is Mr. Rufus Isaacs, the type of modern advocate, from Russell. Strength, passion, sonorousness, magnificence of phrasing, are things which the present generation vaguely approves, in retrospect, but it would titter at a contemporary demonstration of them. While I was reading Piggott's cross-examination, an idea struck me. Why do not the managers of our theatres, always querulous about the dearth of plays, fall back on scenes from famous trials? A trial scene in a play, though usually absurd, is almost always popular. Why not give us actual trial scenes? They could not, of course, be nearly so exciting as the originals, for the simple reason that they would not be real. But they would certainly be more exciting than the average play. Thus I mused, hopefully. But I was brought up sharp by the reflection that it were hopeless to look for an actor who could impersonate Russell could fit his manner to Russell's words, or, indeed, to the words of any of those orotund advocates. To reproduce recent trials would be a hardly warrantable thing. The actual participators in them would have a right to object, delighted though many of them would be. Vain, then, is my dream of theatres invigorated by the leavings of the law courts. On the other hand, for the profits of the law courts, I have a quite practicable notion. They provide the finest amusement in London for nothing. Why for nothing? Let some scale of prices for admission be drawn up, half a guinea, say, for a seat in the well of the court, a shilling for a seat in the gallery, five pounds for a seat on the bench, then, I dare swear, people would begin to realize how fine the amusement is. End of section 21